Right, hands up who hasn't got a clue who I am. Don't be shy. There's always thank you. That's the way to be. All right, um, hands up. We thought I was going to be one of the hairy bikers. <laughs> no, just like to check that as well. I think I'd like to start with how did I get to be up here? Because I think that's quite an important message. Right, first, I, I do ask questions to begin with. So I like to know who I'm talking to. Who thinks I'm here for my brains? Me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was th okay. My boyish good looks. <laughs> All right. Actually, I've got to tell you, I'm only here for my looks. <laughs> the reason I got into telly was because when I did a Scrap Heap Challenge back in 98, I um, had a big moustache and people seemed to remember it somehow. So that's how I became a telly tart. <laughs> and as such, that's quite interesting because um, you've got to be honest about these things. You've got to understand where you're coming from. And um, at that time, I. My very first appearance on television in uh, 98, 98 Scrap Heap Challenge, very first series. Orange team against the yellow team. It wasn't even Scrap Heap Challenge at the day, it was called Scrap Heap. And that was in the olden days stuff. And um, I was uh, there. My family have always called me Richard, except for in the army it was called Dick. They couldn't fit Richard on my helmet, so they wrote Dick. <laughs> my television career started with me as Major Dick which is wonderful. If you put that into Google, it gets quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm actually, I've, I've, got, I've got a doctorate, so I'm actually Dr. Dick. And if you put that in Google, it's equally as bad. <laughs> but the whole mindset with these things are you have to understand where you're coming from, what you're doing there. I want to go back uh, just very briefly, because I'm going to talk about properties, because that's what I was asked to talk about. But I will answer questions on anything, by the way. I'm not shy. And I believe, as you've heard from the start, you have to be honest and have a bit of integrity about who you are and what you talk about. And um, I'm a telly tart. That's what I do for a living. But actually, I do things as well. My first career, I had 20 years um, in the army. The first 10 years were all about um, when we had the, uh, the threat from Eastern Europe. Yeah? I had a life expectancy of 15 minutes as a 19-year-old second lieutenant um, and on the inter-German border. Very different sort of world uh, as a 19-year-old they don't trust you to do anything really. Let's not be too shy about it. But then uh, by the time I finished, after 10 years sort of until the wall came down, I was working in Berlin when the wall came down. Then after that, went into counterterrorism because what are you going to do for a living? And I spent 10 years in counterterrorism before I retired as Lieutenant Colonel. Now, the Army teaches you a lot of things, but one of the main things it teaches you is values. Okay? And it's very important because you learn a lot of different management skills. But the values that come out of that are quite important. And the values that um, I sort of came out with. Any jocks here? Any Scottish people? Scottish bloodlines? Yes, there's always a couple. Yeah. Okay. If you go to the Ministry of Defence, they will tell you the cost of a piper for a Scottish regiment. Fifty-seven thousand pounds a year capitation rate. Okay. If you go to an, a Scottish regiment, the value of a piper is you just can't measure it. Six hundred screaming jocks go over the top of the trenches to certain death when he starts playing. Okay. That's the value as opposed to the cost. And those sort of things you learn in the way through. And that integrity is something that I think is quite important. When I was in the army, money was vulgar. It wasn't a subject we talked about. And we moved around a lot as well. And so I had no desire to get on the property ladder, even though it made sense. Think about going on the property ladder back in the 80s. Yeah? If you did it, how sensible would you have been? What happened to your money? How did things change? But for us, it wasn't something we thought about because you know, we, were <laughs> we were doing different things with our lives. Though I did get my first property when I was serving, and this, this was my lesson on properties to begin with. I was down in Dorset, and uh, I bought a lovely Victorian um, cottage opposite a 12th century church. Um, buyer beware. I didn't realize that every Wednesday the campologists, campologists, bloody bell ringers, <laughs> every Wednesday for a couple of hours to drive you up the bloody walls. <laughs> Idyllic, but um, I should have thought about that one. Um, but. We bought that, and within a month of having bought this lovely cottage to get our roots on the ground, because Dorset was an area important to my core, um, my regiment moved. They upped sticks, and they decided within a month, as part of the changing of the army, we went up to uh, Bramcote, uh, we went up to Gamecock Barracks, up near Nuneaton. Okay? Does anybody know a road that goes from Nuneaton down to Dorset, down to the south of Dorset? No? Because there bloody well isn't one. Yeah? And that's why I had to commute, because we just bought a house. I had to commute weekends. So I thought to myself, this house ownership's not a great idea. Um, having said that, um, as a doer-upper, done it up, sold it and made some money and thought, wasn't so stupid. 
then the rest of my uh, career, I wasn't sort of um, worried about it until I got out. And when you leave the army, you get a little lump sum and you get a chance to buy a house or to settle and do something. I had 20 years in the army and when I was in there, I did scrap heap and I did that. Lots of people don't know, I actually had a, a second career before becoming a full-time teletart. My second career was in the industry, a company called General Dynamics. I don't know if you've come across General Dynamics, anybody? Big multinational, pretty serious stuff. And um, I was part of a, I was running a 2.4 billion pound contract, yeah, um, for the Ministry of Defence with General Dynamics. It's a grown-up stuff. Having learnt values in the army, I learnt about making profits for shareholders. And I was quite good at it. Because the last 10 years I was in the army, I was doing a lot of sort of special forces, rapid response tasks for counterterrorism, getting things done quickly. And because of that, when I went into industry, I had the same mindset, just get it done. JFDI, just do it, yeah? <laughs> and get, get the thing done. And that mindset was quite useful. It's a mindset I've kept to this day. And that getting things done in industry, I used to go home and the dogs would wag their tails. I didn't need friends. So when HR fell out with me because I sacked people, I just shrugged, okay? That's the side of Dick Strawbridge you don't get to see on the telly because people think I'm lovely and cuddly. No, I'm a shit. <laughs> All right, I'm a very good shit and I'm good at what I do. And I, I got, went through general dynamics very quickly and um, I was being held by a glass ceiling um, because we were Canadian run from that time in Britain. And because I was being held by a glass ceiling and I knew I, 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 a year in, I needed to get promoted and get moving up around the place. So I just left, when I did one of the uh, presentations to the president of the board, I actually left open an application on my desk with just the heading application for a director in UN. Yeah, I came back to my desk, it had been slipped underneath and I was promoted within a week. Now, that's because life's about thinking, it's about planning, it's about doing things. And we haven't gone into the world, um, but, but my wife Angel and I have got a chateau in France, we haven't gone into the world based on just seeing what happens next. Thinking is what the world's about. All right, so when I came out of the army, did this time in, um, and I, 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 we'd actually moved and bought in West Malvern. Do people know the Malverns, you know the Malvern Hills? Beautiful place. West Malvern's on the other side. Two sides of Malvern. Great Malvern, yeah, the sun rises in Great Malvern. People get up and work. The sun sets in West Malvern on the other side. That's where the hippies live. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, probably prices are reflected in that. Yeah. But the hippies live on the West Malvern side. And so we were living over there because my, my, my first wife was actually finding herself in that hippie way. And we, had, we made the decision that we were going to um, live over in that part of the world. Loved it. But then... 2003, I had, um, remember this is me working for a big multinational, doing extremely well. Stock options, by the way, anybody want to talk stock options? I love them, yeah? Got given gazillions of them all ready to sort of stay with us, you get your money from it. So I understand business. Um, but in February 2003, and remember I'd done Scrap Heap Challenge in the Army in 98, 99 and 2000, I'd forgotten about it. I just had a bit of fun. I did it with my brothers. And when I did it with my brothers, it was, I was Colonel Dick at that stage. It wasn't quite as embarrassing. My brother was a major. My youngest brother was a, a, a captain. And we were this size. But the moustaches, I had my moustache. David had a medium size. And Bobby had an eyebrow. Yeah. So it was that sort of that shape that we sort of went through. But the three of us had done it for those. Um, and by the way, back home, I'm called Lionel. Lionel Richie, because he's the only one of that group you've ever heard of. Yeah. So my brothers think I'm, because no one's ever heard of them. But anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> when it comes down to... Uh, the decisions that you make and where you are. Well, I was sitting thinking, telly was great, had a bit of fun when I did it, thought no more. I was having a nice career. And in February 2003, out of the blue, I had five television offers in one week. Now, how they got my email, how I was found, I don't exactly know what took place there. Five different companies, five different channels. Do you want to do an engineering show? Well, I, I, that happened, you sort of go, shit, this is really unsubtle. There's something going on here. And um, so we had a family get together in a conversation. And James, my lad, who um, uh, I've done, have you seen Hungry Sailors? Or It's Not Easy Being Green. I've worked with my lad quite a few times, which is a real privilege working with your boy. That was saying, it's a real privilege. But um, he said, Dad, do you want to know something? You're really grumpy. Little shit. Um, you're really grumpy. And um, I said, why don't you try something that's going to be a bit of fun? And so um, I said, I, I took that to heart, and so I went in and resigned. And to which General Dynamics went, are you taking the piss? You know, you've done all this work, you've, you've been promoted, you know, they're, they're talking about directorship, talking about all sorts of proper money stuff, yeah? And I said, no, actually, you know, you know me well enough, I made the mind up, I'm going to go and I'm going to have give this a go. They said, no, you can't do that. What you have to do instead is you have to um, 
take a sabbatical, paid sabbatical for six months to find yourself. <coughs> and do you know what paid sabbatical means? Double dipping. You get paid when you have to do something else, they get paying you anyway, and then at the end you make your mind up. I said, I can't really do that in good faith other than if I promise you three months when I come back. And that's all I can promise you because I don't know what's going to happen. So I said, three months, it was a deal. I went to Los Angeles. This is me becoming a teletart, which is relevant to my property choices, believe it or not. Went to Los Angeles and I made a series called Junkyard Mega Wars. Has anybody ever heard of that? Dodged a bullet there, that was great. I'm glad nobody's heard of that because um, it was shit. <laughs> It was really funny because I had, I had a flat in Hollywood, I had a Mustang, and I was in sort of um, building things out in the desert in San Fernando. And I knew I'd made it on television when I sort of looked up and there's somebody holding an umbrella over me. I shared a Winnebago with Miss Wyoming. Yeah, Bobby Sue, she's a lovely, lovely girl. But she made it my daughter. So the best, you know. But she gave you a hug and all I could think of, it was sad because she spent all her money getting publicized to try and make herself famous. And when she gave you a hug, it was like being hugged by two engineering constructions on her chest. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and she was a good girl, and my advice to her was to actually just start enjoying life. And, and but that was part of me sort of becoming a tart. So I was over there doing that, and I came back and I made my first series for the BBC called uh, Crafty Tricks of War, a series I'm very proud of, a very good, fun series. But then uh, uh, you make these series, and uh, I'll answer questions on anything, by the way, at the end, but when you get to that stage, you're sort of thinking, right, I'm a telly tart now. So I went back to General Dynamics and said, I'm going to actually stick with the television stuff. But I gave them the three months, and in fact, I gave them four months. And I actually came back and gave consultancy for them at later stages as well when they had problems. And um, Telic, the second Iraq sort of war. And um, I charged them teletarts rates, because you, which is just fun. You, what do you do? You put your arm as far as you think you can get it when somebody asks you to do a job for them. Um, I didn't say I was nice, yeah. But so um, but we was, I had the situation where, having finished General Dynamics, I was employed in television, which meant that you do a lot of Resting. You know this resting thing where you actually sort of, you're unemployed, you yeah, have between jobs, and you have, to have, you have to have do something really. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? And as a family, we sat down and we decided what we we're going to do was embrace sustainability, embrace all of that side of life. And because I had time available to me, I was actually going to um, see about going more self-sufficient. I've been a hunting, shooting, fishing, killing, eating bloke all my life. I've also, since I was five years old, worked in the garden with my dad. Yeah? Um, I do a lot of mechanical fixing of stuff. I've done scrappy time. I had, it was good with my hands. So let's buy somewhere that allowed us to actually use my time better. Okay? So when I'm not working, I can do something beneficial for us. And uh, with that, um, that's what we bought. Does anybody remember the series, It's Not Easy Being Green? Yeah? 2005. 2005, being green was a joke, all right? It was, people took the piss out of it all the time. It wasn't, and that's not fair, because it's always been quite serious. But this is the plot we bought down in Tardreth in Cornwall. And I put that up because, talking about small holdings, talking about how you're gonna do things, that, that's three acres. And self-sufficiency on three acres is bloody hard work. I did not want to be a 12th century peasant, working from <laughs> dawn to dusk, yeah? So our mindset for our series, which was a quite important one, was, um, Living in the tw uh, 21st century lifestyle yeah, with a lower impact. You know, treading lightly on the earth, all that side of life, which involved how do we actually live in a green way. And this was our plot to do it on. Now, the whole area there, it's, it was absolutely gorgeous. What we got was, um, look at it wasn't in very good nick. <coughs> Big mistake number one, listed building. Environmental issues, listed buildings. Anybody here from listed building, planning, consents people? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I make that noise or was I thinking it? Um, but suffice to say, uh, try, try doing a greenhouse when people are telling you that you've actually got to use um, um, oak rubbed off the inside thigh of virgins from the Victorian era or some nonsense, yeah? Um, not good, not good to try and do it. So um, I was quite naughty and uh, I just thought being green is more important than saying yes to you. And so we had some nice battles. And I know I don't make friends. But the, um, the sh seven bedroom farmhouse. Seven bedroom farmhouse. And we, um, that's what it's looking like now. It's the, um, the new roof on it. And you can't do, use Delaball slate. You've got to make compromises. You can see the outbuilding on the outside. Um, the outbuilding with the, all the um, photovoltaic on it. Yes, permitted development in the rest of the world. And is that part of the curtilage and all the rest of it? I just had an argument. And I went to the head of the council in Como and said, I'm very happy to go public and have a debate with you about whether or not I should have photovoltaics and try and be green. Um, funny enough, I won that one. Um, 
That's the building that had the photovoltaics on it. Uh, by the way, I shamelessly use my position on television. I had a meeting with the planning, the head of planning on the scaffolding with a camera crew. <laughs> yeah. You gotta use your advantage. Did I mention I wasn't very nice? <laughs> but when, when, it, when it comes to property decisions and things, that was the building that you saw before. And all right, it's <coughs> a courtyard. When we bought the place, that has planning permission for three cottages, okay? Three holiday cottages. Um, but the holiday cottages planning permission that they gave, because they were trying to get somebody to embrace and take over this listed building, is for three really ugly cottages that don't aren't at all in keeping with the listed building. But they did that anyway because that's what they wanted. They wanted somebody to come and take it over. So that was part of it. I just put roofs on, put it back to where it was, and didn't even try and go forward as <coughs> holiday homes. But what I did do, because I'm not stupid, was I put the foundations in the back of some of it, had an inspector by a bloke, and got my, my building consents all agreed. So I have got now permanent sort of um, planning permission for it because I've done the first inspection. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's our life. And if you look at that, the place is comfortable, but it's also very green. You know, we used, go back to 2005, okay? I did um, Test the Nation with Anne Robinson and, and uh, um, Philip Schofield, yeah? I wore hemp underwear. And it was all I could do to get Anne to get me, make me show everybody my pants. Because we, we used hemp because it was a material. Back then, people didn't talk about it. We used sheep's wool insulation. We do you know what I did? I reduced our bills. I'm tight. I am an Ulsterman. Okay, Ulstermen are people who are from Scotland who could swim in the 17th century, <laughs> all right? We came across, so I've got my jock blood. And uh, saving the money um, and not spending out on bills is bloody important. Now, that's the mindset we went into it. Invest, and do you know what? If you want to be green, you don't put up photovoltaics, you don't put up sort of wind turbines. You know that you insulate, you reduce. You go LEDs, where's the LED advertisement coming off of the chaps with the LED? You actually reduce your <laughs> usage, reduce your bills as a star. I had a spring. I used the spring water for all my showers and loos and things, putting a pump system into it to do that. Heated, best bang for your bucks, solar thermal, yeah? It's not very exciting, best, best bang for your bucks. So we did all of that sort of stuff, and we introduced people. BBC Two, it's not easy being green, didn't know what to hit it, because we had four and a half, five million people watching every program. And it sort of tapped in to a mindset that is sort of quite important. <laughs> this whole thing's now my ex-wife's problem. <laughs> So it's for sale if anybody's interested. <laughs> yeah, if you go down to Cornwall, it's sort of, I know, I'm bad. But anyway, so, but we had a water wheel. We used water like power and all the rest of it. And uh, to be fair, as a property, it was great. Anybody from Cornwall? Come on, you must be some in Cornish blood because you cross the Tamar and there's a Cornishness, yeah? There's a Cornishness. And they, they, they're, they're still uh, Walter Valiant's army type thing going on down that part of the world. But it's interesting. I think there's only four kilometres of the Tamar. If you dug the Tamar for another four kilometres, Cornwall would be an island. That could be a good thing. <laughs> but having lived there for a period of time, you know, it, it's a very interesting place to live. We had a village with no second homes in it. It was a proper village. And now that's very rare, considering we were, uh, I was half a mile away from an intercity to London. Okay? So a nice place and lots of very interesting. But again, what do you want? What do you want out of life? And we made our decisions, and that allowed us to go forward. Okay, first marriage. Um, my, my 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 wife Bridget loved a bit. She's a hippie now, and she's off sort of fixing was a campaigner. Does very important work with bees, by the way, which I, th I think is really quite important. But um, now I'm <laughs> I'm in a different world. Has anybody uh, not seen Escape to the Chateau as a matter of interest? Uh, have, have you seen it? Have you, you haven't you haven't seen Escape to the Chateau? Okay, well. The premise is, you can't write the script. I stand in front of you, probably the luckiest man you, uh, you, you're gonna ever meet, yeah? Um, but you can write the script that puts me here, really, except for the big mustache and television thing. And that's because my girl and I, um, I live in a castle in France. That's what I do. And we met, and when we met, um, I promised my daughter, I've, I've got a 34, 32, a five and a four at the minute, yeah? And I promised my daughter that when I, when I, was, when I separated from my wife and divorced, I would never go out with anybody younger than her. And so my answer was, don't ask Angel her age. Because then, <laughs> that, and that works, because that's the truth, all right? Um, sort of. But um, anyway, we met, and uh, it's a love story of odd couples. And uh, Angel is very vintage. She's, um, she runs something called the Vintage Patisserie. She's an events manager. Uh, first time I met her, and we knew we were going to meet each other, because um, we have a, f a friend in common. And I spent all my time looking her between the eyes. Okay, and if you've seen the series, you'll know exactly why. Because red lippy and big boobs, and I was over fifty, and I didn't want to dribble. 
Okay, so that was the sort of that was the mindset I was sort of I had, and it's, it's the real world that we're, we're living in. And um, we got to know each other and actually fell in love. And three or four months into this, um, I saw we had, a, we had a conversation. I said, "Darn, I'm having a great time. Got to end this now." And you've got to go, and you've got to go and find a, um, a younger man. Go and have babies, and go do all the things you're supposed to do because you're so gorgeous. Yeah. Do you know what she did? Now you won't believe what a bitch she was. She said, "I want you." <laughs> How horrible can you get? All right. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, well, bugger, this is great. What do we do now? The wrong side of fifty, and sort of, um, and I thought, okay, there's twenty years between us, and I'm sort of thinking to myself, okay. And then the thing of children comes up. And you know what? You're only here once. You're only here once. My, my first two are, are absolutely gorgeous, James and Charlotte. And now Arthur and Dorothy are equally as gorgeous. So um, I just thought, go for it. And it's, it's interesting because when you're the wrong side of 50, you, you, I think you sort of work out you're a little bit mortal. But I'm not yet. Uh, we know that. That's, that's not going to happen just yet because of the way we're going. So we went, oh, we went on a holiday. First holiday either of us had had for a long time. And this holiday was down near Carcassonne, down near Montpellier, south of France, near the Pyrenees, near the Med, near the Black Forest area. Beautiful part of the world. We had a little jeet. And we were in a jeet, and um, it, was, it was lovely. You went into the jeet, big log fire, little kitchenette, courtyard. Each floor had a bedroom and a bathroom on it. And we were all loved up. Okay? It was really, really special time. Been along to the supermarket, filled up with the foie gras, the red wine and the cheese. Sat and watched the film. I blame Russell Crowe for a lot of this. Has anybody seen The Good Year? where he's a city gent who actually ends up um, by, uh, uh, taking over a chateau. Um, sat and watched that and thought, you know, it was all really sweet and it's quite romantic and lovely. Then the next thing you know, we walked along to the notaire's office in the village where we were staying and they have prices on there. We could buy the jeet we were staying in with our credit card. It's about 20k to buy the house we were staying in. And you know, it's sort of like a little eureka moment, you know, why are we paying mortgages? Why are we doing all this working for that? And why are we buying when we can actually just go and buy something like that? But then the whole question comes, where do you want to live? I was based in Cornwall. Um, Angela was based in London. Do the analysis of the UK. And we didn't have to live anywhere. I was not going to live in London. Hands up, everybody from London. Sorry to me, it's a shithole. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm a country boy. They tried posting me there once as an army major, and I said no. And the colonel said, it's an order. And I said, I'm really shit at those. And I wouldn't go. So I had a punishment posting me sent to Northern Ireland where I had a ponytail, and the queen gave me a medal. So I don't really care. But London, I couldn't, couldn't do full time. Love visiting and going to see Ange. That, that was great. But she couldn't see herself in Cornwall because the Tamar going over the one gene that they share between them. That's sort of a mindset. Um, and so we're thinking, where do we live? And do the analysis. Scotland? bit far north, Wales, <laughs> right? Northern Ireland, couldn't do that because you have to have web feet and that's where I'm from. And then you do an assassination of every area of the UK inside the M25, around the home counties. This is busy, it's manic. You know, it's very different because I, I, I can talk as a rural sort of French inhabitant now. That mindset was there for us to sort of think, what do we want to do? And so having sort of seen the price of this property and not knowing where we we're going to go, we decided, you know what, let's do it. Let's, and do you know how long it took us from seeing the price, getting on the internet to deciding to live in France, was probably 15 minutes, okay? And that was a decision made. And do you remember the thing about me being uh, analyzing, trouble solving problems? I do think, but I also believe you live with this as well as that. And so we made that decision quite well. Having said that, I was so screwed. Because what happened was, the internet, you get on there and you have a look at jeets and little houses and things, and then in no time at all, what happens is you've gone from the sort of the 20, 30,000 pound ones you could buy for nothing, yeah, to um, one that's sort of 50,000 pounds. Do you know what the buggers do? When you're looking at a 50,000 pound little sort of house, farmhouse, they throw in a manoir. So you get a manor house that's really run down. And then you, throw, you click onto the manor house pages, and then all of a sudden you're up looking at manor houses, and then at 100K around that, you see your first baby chateau. And then after that, you're into chateau porn, yeah. <laughs> And, and you're there. And within about half an hour, Angela had actually seen a six million pound when she really fancied. So rewind back to where we are. And we were sort of thinking, no, that's not what we're going to have. We're going to have a chateau that we can actually afford. Now, we moved out of London to South End. And that was advice on buying chateaus. Don't do it with young children. <laughs> what did we do? We did it with young children. And we did it for all the right reasons. And it was a brilliant idea, actually. But that, this is the family at South End in our flat. We had a flat overlooking the Thames while we searched. And we searched. You've seen the series. Maybe we've got a feel for how long we search for. 
they come across. Did you know we searched for four years to find our chateau? That doesn't come across. Bec four years. And that included from South End, I would take a day trip by driving the car down, getting the Channel Tunnel, driving, uh, leave the house at um, four o'clock in the morning, get the six o'clock crossing, drive down, see three shadows, come back, take, get the midnight crossing and be home for two in the morning, all right, to look at shadows because you can't trust the estate agents. The people are showing it to you. Because it's all commission-based, they don't want you to know exactly where it is. And so I became a dab hand at Google Earth, finding the shadows and working out, we weren't going to see that one because it's beside a filling station. We weren't going to see that one because it looks really lovely, but that bit behind is actually an industrial estate. Or you discover that the plan you get, you don't get it all because somebody has actually um, sold off the property edges. Because to make money, the first thing they do is sell the crown jewels a bit at a time. So we were off looking at a chateau when this came through the post as a picture. And um, we were four hours south of where we eventually bought, and Angel panicked. The estate agent played a blind, a nice little short email. This is about to go in the market. It's going to get snapped on up. Are you interested? And so we're four hours south of there, and Angel says, put an offer in. I said, no, we can't put an offer in. We're, we, have to, we have to go and see it. Put an offer in. It's going to take us four hours to get there. Put an offer in. And I said, very strong. People say, do I ever say no to Angel? Perfect example. I said, no, we're going to go and look at it. So we left the hotel, got in the car, and drove straight there, just to put it into context. So four hours of a journey. And she's all this time, it's gone. If it's been sold before we get there, I just knew I was going to get grief. Um, <laughs> so we came up, and, and when we got to the place, um, this is the plan of our plot. And you can see that the, the, you, you can actually see the chateau there. The moat was all the way around. We've got some of the old historical documents where it's a proper moat. But this is our land. But you'll see here a little French bugger thing they do. That white means it's not in the sale. And what they've done is they've got planning permission. And the planning permission that they'd got um, was for people to actually build two houses out of this with a separate entranceway and take over part of the wall garden. We said, deal breaker, we can't do that. Um, and they said, oh, right, well, we'll just have to see if, if we can, I said, we'll buy it, provide. By the way, from going around the corner to see the chateau for the first time, Angel said she wanted to put an offer in there. I made her look inside the front door before we made the offer, just, just to prove that we, I saw how strong I was. So we went in, did it, and, but this was a possible deal breaker. And so to overcome that, we, we asked, and they said, well, they said, no, we want that as well. And so we ended up buying that separately from the chateau to get the whole package. Now, this property, um, which if you've seen the television program, is, is, is not too shoddy. Um, need a lot of work done on it. It's need a lot of work done on it, but it's actually um, chateau, planning permission for seven bedroom, two, three bedrooms, an orangery, a building we didn't actually remember until we found it under the, uh, the brambles that's over here, a walled garden, woodland with wild boar in it, okay? The thing is absolutely stunning. Failed to sell at auction in the village, failed to sell at an auction two years before we actually, it came back on the market again, and the hammer went down at 100K and nobody would pay for it, okay? In France, they don't want old properties. We bought it for 280,000 pounds, okay? And that's um, the sort of 50 bedroom, a uh, 50 room chateau, not 50 bedroom, 50 room chateau plus these other outbuildings and stuff, all for 280K. Now, that's a pretty good deal. But it was needed some work done on it, to fair to say, because there was one tap in the basement of one of the towers. But that's okay. Well done. Think property people. You've you got your smarts on there. Where are you going to find... Um, um, that's our house, by the way. Okay? Where are you going to find... And that's what it was like when we found it. But, you know, it was all overgrown. Nobody lived in it for 30 years, type touch. But tell me you're going to find something like that with the seven bedroom, with the two, three bedrooms. Oh, by the way, there's more bedrooms, there's more houses around there. There's a piggery that's, I would have bought it for the piggery in the wall garden. I didn't care about the chateau. But th the piggery is gorgeous. And that's, that's a lovely, there's another two houses that can be sort of converted. Where would you buy that in the UK? Anywhere. I don't, you can go as far north, as far uh, west as you want. You can't find that sort of thing that people wouldn't be salivating over. Okay? This costs the same price as a new box in our village. And the village is a mile away from where we are, and that's where the children go to school. And that um, is because the French don't value it. They don't care about it. So, come back to the question, why do we buy? Why do we buy places? Why do we do it? Because French, French rent. Yeah, that's what they do. But that's the chateau. You'll see, um, then with the day we turned up, they'd actually scraped away a lot of the, um, the weeds and stuff for us. So they left us with a mud bath. That was very decent of them. That's where our chickens live. 
the chickens have a stone built house because we've got so many we don't know what to do with them. <laughs> Eat your heart out. Did I mention how lucky I was up here, right at the very beginning? Yeah, that's my walled garden, a bit overgrown. In the walled garden, there's a folly. Sell that in London, that's worth 120K, isn't it? Yeah, and um, down the side, these, these are the buildings I've got planning for. The one with the dorm is one of the three bedrooms, the ruin on the left is the piggery. The one this end, <coughs> excuse me, is massive. It's truly, truly large and really quite exciting. And um, yeah, that's, well, uh, for the next series, I've just been out there with my chainsaw and cleared it out, and that's where our geese live, okay, which is taking the mickey, isn't it? It is taking the mickey, but the, we do envy television. We signed for it, we did it. We found it four years ago today, actually. Four years ago we found it. Um, we signed for it, and you sign in the two stages. Um, the documentation, we had a, an English-speaking notaire, our solicitor, bit of a, a, a poor description really because he'd been to Ireland once I think was his qualification to be called an English speaking notaire. Couldn't speak English, yeah. We couldn't speak French. We paid for a French, uh, for a French legal translator to do our documents. Didn't get it to us before the signature day and turned up on the day with it in partial English. So I translated all of our contracts before turning up on Google Translate. Anybody ever used Google Translate? <laughs> It's hieroglyphics with funny bits added to it. And trying to make, I failed my French O level three times. I'm shit at that. Okay, just a statement. And so to prove that, I became an army officer, to prove that I could actually speak French, they turned me into a French paratrooper. I went with the Foreign Legion, jumped out of airplanes. And apparently, by falling from the sky four times, I'm a French speaker. <laughs> I'm bloody sure I didn't. Yeah. So that, this whole thing was, uh, it was fraught. It, uh, it was very interesting as well, because we did a lot of research. Remember, we, we didn't sort of go into this half cock. We did a lot of research. And we were happy with what we got. Got the key. <coughs> that's my girl. And that, that's Dorothy. <coughs> very young, very gorgeous doing it. That moves us to the stage where here we are. We've got, um, we moved in. It was in pretty ropey order, but it was pretty special. Now, <laughs> can you see that moat? It's frozen. That's what happens when you buy in January. And um, the windows aren't very clear in this, but without glass... The inside's the same temperature as the outside, okay? So that's what we bought, a minus seven degree chateau that was bloody freezing. And we couldn't have been happier. We couldn't have been happier. If you get to see any of the series, you can see our sort of endeavors to do it. We inherited so much treasure. Spitalfield Market in London, yeah? Very, very, yeah, no, it's the sort of place that's very trip and hip and trendy and all the rest of that stuff. Andrew would buy a magazine, an old, an old ma magazine from between the wars. Did you pay a fiver for it, yeah? We have complete sets of magazines pre-First World War that the owners wanted to empty out and get rid of for us. They were saying, oh, don't worry, we're gonna, we're, we'll, we'll have to make sure everything's skipped and we'll have a bonfire before you come. Angel was shitting herself. She was, really, she was really panicking about this. So what ended up happening was, Jack, 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 you've done so much for us already. Just leave them. It will be our pleasure to tidy it up, yeah? And we have got thousands thousands of these magazines all bundled up because they didn't see a reason to throw things away. They just moved them up into the attic. And we've used them for all sorts of things. Um, Art Deco little stove that's now in our, our, our um, um, botanical suite. All sorts of stuff. And there's a little area there. There's a couple of areas we haven't even explored yet, even though we've been there for four years. And that's because I'm not rushing through. And that corner in there, we've, um, we've got a lot of stuff. I'm not quite sure. But I wanted to explore it in my own time. So what I did was, nice and simply, I put down two dead pigeon carcasses on the floor. All right? Ugh. There's pigeons living in the attic, and these things are 20-year-old, desiccated, look horrible. But I put them on the floor in this corner and knew that nobody would touch them and nobody would go near them. It's like a ghost fence from the olden days of druids. All right? And do you know what? That's my corner. And I was, I, had, I was up there talking to my mate. I said to him, this is my corner. I'll, and this, when Arthur's old enough, we'll, we'll, have look, we'll have a look and see what's hidden away in the corner. And it's really quite grubby. I said, you know, what's that? And I looked down and I put my hand out and I picked up something and it was a 17th century French musket just sitting in the corner of my crap, yeah? I, uh, it's missing the hammer action off it, yeah? But it's the short barrel, you know the ones, the three musketeers, they put on the things, yeah? Got one of those. I also... Um, Picked up a, uh, and this is one little patch, I haven't explored it very much. I picked up an 1852 Jocelyn Carbine walnut stock from the American Civil War, okay? In my little corner. So I'm just waiting. 
our outbuildings, we haven't even searched in all the attics yet because I want the kids to be old enough to come in our adventure with us. Yeah? But that's what you get. You get all this crap and we love it. That's what you get in the outbuildings. And do you know what? They were going to have a bonfire and get rid of it all. That, this, 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 <laughs> by the way, this is the inside of the chicken house. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did tell you how lucky I was. The history, that's the chateau with the moat around it. Okay? Now, lots of problems buying something this old. Do you know um, listing consents and uh, building historique and all the rest of it? Nah. They don't care. Our mayor learnt some English for our wedding when we got married there, yeah? Lovely man, we bring business into the village, into the neighbourhood. Everybody is quite happy that the really, really stupid English people are there, yeah? But what's quite funny, see this, see this castle? This is the castle with a moat around it. This is the Mott. Chateau de la Mott doesn't mean moat. Mott means hill. Mott and Bailey, do you remember school? We learnt more about Mott and Bailey's, that's what this is. Built to keep the English out. <laughs> Fucked up there, didn't they? <laughs> As I told everybody when I got arrow slits, we got arrow slits in the chateau, and my son James has got a longbow. Be nice to the British people, I say. Okay, but there's history there, and I think that's a, a huge part of the sort of the mindset about what you get. And we're we're caretakers of this. We're looking after. This. But this is the old system, and this plot here, by the way, is our walled garden, and this, these buildings are there. This little point, you see, see this little building here just above the um, A of La Motte? We, um, we put a triptych, uh, we put a parkour around the outside perimeter, an exercise course for Angela. She wanted to start getting fit. And we put the children's trampoline there so they can bounce on it when she's doing some of the exercises. But to do that, you have to dig a little hole because we did it at ground level. I dug the hole and there's a little rock sticking up about this much in the middle of my hole. Arthur's quite chunky. I thought he was going to hurt himself. So I started digging out this little rock to make sure it was better. The bloody thing was a metre and a half long. Uh, so my little rock pimple that was just, it was probably four inches higher than I could accept, was a metre and a half long. And it's the corner of that building, which is an old chapel. Yeah, and there's old mortar and bits in it. We have got so much more we have yet to discover. But that's part of our, our adventure. And do you know how many complaints I had about digging up? None. <coughs> I went along to the records office and they were really quite interested. Said, well, did you find anything? That was it. Okay, so it's a very different mindset. But we get the history. And you also inherit things like this. These, the, the, this flooring and all the different stuff, that's all in there, untouched. Um, and for us, it's sort of, a bit of every single um, banister has got a little line on it. These are the, hi the high level. That's my circus, by the way, it goes up round to both sides. And at the bottom of every one of these posts has got a cast line on it. It would have actually paid us to buy the chateau and break it up for architectural salvage. In reality, we've got the original bill for building the chateau between 1868 and 1874, and in today's money, it's a million pounds for materials and labour. That, that's what that's that's what it was, what it scales up to. But it's just things like yeah, you know, I got a dumb waiter. We've got hand painted wallpaper. All these things are all part of our adventure. Now, it's not easy commuting to London, and with this comes the responsibility of how do you pay for your choice. And that's a huge thing. But Angel was actually doing events anyway. And part of our idea, we had a whole shopping list of things to do. She wanted to do weddings. I'm going to do rocking horse courses. Couples are going to come along. I'm a grandfather, all right? And people my age coming along, the ladies go up to London or the men, or, or the men come up to London, but the ladies come into my workshop and will hand make rocking horses at some stage because we've got the workshops to do it. We do high-end sort of um, people coming across and eating. People come and they eat with us, yeah? And uh, then I take them to the market and then they cook for me and then I charge them, because I'm not stupid. People, we charge people to come and work in our garden. How clever is that? Who says the Irish are thick, eh? And there's all mine, but all these ideas are things we had about how we actually have a revenue stream. If you have a five bedroom chambre d'hote, which is the sort of, the in, in France, you're allowed to have five without having any regulations, no fire access and all the rest of that. You don't have to change your house for five bedrooms being let. If you have that, based on a chateau, 60% occupancy, 140K a year income in our area. That's charging our rates. Nothing to do with television, so it's there. And that, so you can see there's a business there. The problem is there's a thousand bed changes for that. And so when it came to us deciding, we've got one of our columns we always go to, how much do we want to do? What's the joy factor? And the reason we're not a bed and breakfast is I could not be arsed. And I think that's, you know, I've got to the age where I don't have to do what I don't want to do. Okay? Um, that's, if you can just about make it out in this light, there's no light pollution. It's quite dark. You can come and see. I don't even see it on the computer. But that's a starry night with us. No light pollution. There is no light pollution. Angela came out of East London and Nina, Nina, all day long, all night long. Yeah, lights everywhere. No darkness to this place. 
She's scared of the dark. <laughs> she's, uh, uh, the first day, you saw her with the key. She hadn't used the key until the first day that she came to let herself in. Because when we moved in, I, I had to go off to, to um, America to earn money to pay for things. So I was making a survival series in America. And she came back, dro she dropped me at the um, railway station because there is no such thing as sort of taxis. Yeah? So she dropped me at the railway station. And when she dropped me at the railway station, she came back and didn't realize the key turns the other direction than you would think. So she couldn't get in. And of course, pitch black. Arthur is screaming. Dorothy's on her hip. Arthur throws up. Dorothy's crying. And God, my name was Dirt. But um, <laughs> that's all part of the game. You have to have a vision. There you go. This is what we're like now. It's actually, it's a very beautiful place to live. And yeah, we, we, we go through a lot of pain to get to there. Weddings, big thing of what we do. That's our orangery and how we're doing it. It's us listening to some of the speeches. And um, that's all I've got, really got time for. But I'll take questions on anything. Thank you. No questions. Go on, anything. <coughs> right. When you, when I've got the experience obviously from uh, Cornwall, and believe it or not, it's it's pretty simple. The insulation side of life comes in first. The other thing is sourcing our materials and what we're doing. Um, if you're trying to do something locally sourced, you're in trouble. But all our woods locally sourced that we're actually doing. So France, I can buy oak that comes from the woods near me. So at every level, when it comes to our event things we're doing, all our food comes from within 50 miles. Our sparkling wine isn't sort of champagne, it's local. You know, everything we, tr we try, that's always in mind. Angel has got a background of vintage. Um, um, the furniture, you actually, it's quite interesting. If you, if you look at the picture, uh, well, hold on, there's a good one. Yeah. Not a single new chair. Every one of those came from a charity shop, yeah? That's all been covered, but it has to be covered nicely. 50 euros in a charity shop. Okay, no vase has ever been bought in you in our house, yeah. Um, the butterflies, all right, they're, 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 they're desiccated and rehydrated type things, but everything around the place, this bloody nightmare of a thing. Is anybody electrical? Oh, get it, do not ever order a, an American chandelier that's sort of 60 years old and really shit to rewire, but everything is old. And I think that's one of the bits we have to do. Our heating, we've got a mixture between um, gas and uh, solid fuel wood fire, all going to a thermal store. The infrastructure's in there. I haven't put my biomass system in yet because you eat an elephant a bite at a time. And we're just, we're, we're munching our elephant at the minute, but we're putting solar panels into Jenny and Steve's place across the way because they've got a south facing wall that's big enough. We'll be putting solar thermal onto our roof when the roof is being redone. I'm not going to do it as an extra trip now just to make a statement. I'm going to do it when it's the right time to do it. And what we've done is, remember, we spent our money buying this place, and then we've earned to do it. If you see the first series, we work our horses off because there's no labour involved, because we hadn't, couldn't afford any. Then do the first weddings, which were all planned and done before telly came out to you, for you to see. Then the money comes in, we do more. Money comes in, we do more. And then insulation. Insulation. Insulation, you've got a major problem. We, that actually is a single original glass. Now, original glass is very different, but it's got this special sort of French system for including drafts. The left-hand side of it is a first double-glazed oak window, yeah. So we're re and I've got all the um, I've started making the oak windows with double glazing in them to put in. Um, we have some. If you see the front of the chateau, um, uh, in fact, it's quite too far back. But if you see the front of the chateau, some of those windows are double glazed that have been replacement windows, but they're ugly, and Angel wants rid of them, yeah. But we're not getting rid of them because they're doing the job at the minute until we replace them with oak, local oak, double glazed windows. So we're doing that. But remember, my wall garden is a big statement for my sustainability as well. Go on, ask me a really hard... Sorry? Truffles. Yeah, thousand, thousand years a kilo. They're not coming on fast enough is the answer. Yeah, but we are, the, the, tr the truffles, I've uh, got another three years before I didn't expect to see anything. Yeah. Dorothy Longaval. Dorothy Longaval married into the Baglionis, and it was their wedding present to actually have the chateau. We've got the whole history there. Um, but it had been 1868. And Dorothy, because remember, I've got a Dorothy, and, and, and when the, 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 the son of the count who died, which forced the sale of the place, yeah, when he discovered she was called Dorothy, he, he bought all the stuff to show us Dorothy Longaval. And in the windows, um, you've actually got um, little images of Dorothy. She's quite a buxom wench from what I can see in there, yeah? <laughs> but they, it, w it was her sort of, uh, she, she was responsible for it. Um, 
That was Donna. That was Donna. That was the DI one. Uh, Donna has sold her chateau and moved on. Yeah, because she was there by herself. Really hard, hard to do it by yourself as a project. Yeah, Angel and I are a strong team. Yeah, she does all the arty stuff. Yeah, and I just do dog work underneath. Yeah, but it, 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 but you have to have some support. And she's decided to move on. Uh, so, so we don't know what's happening with it with the treasure. That it's there somewhere. It's treasure it's there somewhere. Did you mention there was going to be a third season? We've had five already. Thanks for being such an avid follower. <laughs> To be, to be fair, we've, we're, we're in, this is our fourth year. Um, there's another series coming out before Christmas. Um, we, we haven't finished filming it, which is why I shouldn't really be here. But we're, but, but we're actually, it's interesting because we, we're, again, it's turning more the way of how does a chateau pay for itself is more of the theme. And what, is, what, what makes sense? And so we've got a glamping area, we've got weddings as events, we've got other things happening. And, uh, we, but we're still doing more. The place is still, still quite a lot to do. The first question usually is, have you finished yet? To which I just go... Yeah, <laughs> the, the answer is no to that. Would it have been as successful as it obviously is without the team being a bit behind it? Yeah, of course not. So that yeah, really but but, but, come, but come back. Do you remember the bit I said? When we moved out there, we had weddings booked in and uh, our Food Lovers Weekends booked in before you saw it on television. Yeah. The first programme, we, f we, we finished with our, our marriage in November, first year. You didn't see it until July the following year. Yeah. We just can't sit and do nothing, and so we started because because Angel was in events anyway, and because of the things I we were had all the revenue streams that we were doing, and they were filling up. And it's interesting because people have asked, "Can we come along on Food Lovers Weekend?" The people who had booked on our Food Lovers Weekends prior to the television have had the first priority to come along, and and and, and that's the point. You could have sixty percent occupancy in a in a chambre d'hote in a chateau without television and expect eight hundred forty k a year in. That wasn't a television number. That was a numbered. And weddings, anybody who's been involved in our DIY has been snowed under with people who were, that's the power of television. And do you remember this bit about me being a bit of a thinker? Do you think I'm using television or do you think television's using me? Our contract is nice and simple. The production company cannot ask us to do anything. Because if we don't do that, you end up not being real. And hopefully you get, the bloke you see here is the same person you got on there, because I don't give a shit. Life is too short and you have to be yourself and those sorts of things is, and am I using television for marketing? Marketing? Of course I'm not that stupid. You know, because we, we've got a couple of million people watch it. But the, the, the thing is, it's, it's actually global now. And uh, we have Dutch people turning up all the time. And we do all these events. We, we, it's full of Dutch. Um, we've had Australian, we've had Swedish. Lots of people are coming now to see us. That's the television. We can't, meet, we can't service the need because we can't do many because it's us and we're not going to change. We've said we're going to do 12 weddings a year, not the um, 300 requests we've had for weddings. Other chateaus do 40 a year without any television. So uh, you know, if we were doing something else and we had no television, maybe we, we could do more, but we don't want to do that because we don't want to sell out to, uh, and remember we've got young children. And the last wedding of the year, our last September wedding of the year is the winter heating wedding. All the money goes into the pot and pays for heating for the year. Yeah, so we never have to worry about staying warm. Not very green, but it saves you going around a coat all the time. Yeah. Yeah. What's been the most satisfying part of the journey so far? Um, first wedding. First wedding, um, and that was ours actually. That <laughs> the, yeah, you know, that sounds, this, it sounds a bit smug, but we had to be ready. And we weren't completely ready, but we had to be ready. Interesting, I, I had about two months of a snag list after our wedding to catch up with all the things we needed to get done. But it was there. Um, it was also very important because we made the decision not to have weddings in the chateau afterwards when we used the orangery because 200 family and friends partying in your chateau because somebody put some bloody music. You see this? That was my floor in the entrance hall. And I was shitting myself. I was running here watching to see if the thing was actually going to go through because I'd been underneath it earlier. So there's a mindset there. So um, being ready for that. And remember, we only had a honeymoon suite plus we had a couple of reception rooms done. And meeting that was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous thing. <laughs> Last question, sir. Come on. Right, okay. Hands up anybody who thinks that shadow's not going to be there after I've gone. <laughs> That's your answer. And by the way, we got a 200 page cer a document and told me all about all of these things. And do you know how much I cared? I've got this thing, and I'm going to be very rude here. I put really. And if my pulse doesn't change, my give a fuckometer doesn't register. <laughs> and and I, I don't actually think life should be dictated by those things. It's going to outlive me. And we have got woodwork. And we've treated everything for that. But um, we've got damped. Do you know why we've got damped? Because the actual, we've got a, a, um, 
an earth cellar. We could roll in, and, but we got stone, granite all the way around so as, a, as a barrier coming through. There's a lot of positives. The chateau was bloody well built, full stop, yeah? And put it this way, anything that wasn't well built that's a couple of hundred years old is rubble. And that's usually a part of it. And you have to, it's risk management, not complete risk avoidance. And that's the way I go through life anyway. No, no, no. This little French bloke came in and dug a hole. But I, no, no, I'd, I'd love to say yes, but give over. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be hanging around. If you've got any more questions, you were too shy to ask, come and see me. Thank you very much.